Hi there, I'm John Roberts and welcome to IAPSI in Conversation where we talk to designers and structural engineers about what inspires them and their life and career. Uh, today I'm de delighted to welcome Steve Webb as my guest. Steve is the, one of the founding directors of Webb Yates Engineers, which is a 60 strong multidisciplinary practice based in London, Birmingham and Bristol. He's led many award-winning projects and pioneered the practices approach to innovation and sustainability, encouraging the use of non-conventional materials to design low carbon and environmentally conscious structures. He was IAPSI's Milne Medal Lecturer in 2020 uh, for discussing wood, stone, moral calculus and big picture thinking, which I thoroughly enjoyed at the time and is available online because I checked. So Steve, where did this all start? Was there a particular experience in your childhood that nudged you towards a career in your engine as an engineer? Uh, I wanted to be an archaeologist, actually. <laughs> I think when I was a kid, we had, uh, when I was in primary school, I was about eight, and we had a, a, a play about Heinrich Schliemann and how he figured out where Troy was from the kind of stories and, uh, and whatever, and excavated and found the walls of, uh, of the city of Troy and was digging them up. And I was kind of always uh, captivated by that. But my, um, my, grandparents actually my grandfathers were both mechanics and my grandmother was um uh kind of worked in a haberdashery my mother's a draftsman my dad's an engineer so i think probably it's in our uh, blood a little bit so my uh, my dad worked in the middle east when i was a kid and we used to live in a sort of dusty not not dubai on the opposite coast of the uae we used to live in the mountains and um uh there would be lots of people building dams and building airports and driving up dusty tracks with trucks full of laborers you know and pouring millions of tons of concrete and it seemed like a really kind of exciting yeah. indiana jones type of uh thing a bit like heinrich schliemann but putting in, putting it in the ground rather than digging it out of the ground so <laughs> which then makes it interesting what you did next because because uh, I was going to ask about your, your, your early adventures in contracting because of course you did start digging didn't you you, you worked as a site engineer with Lang but then yeah. you worked in the tunnels on the Jubilee line extension was that, yeah, that was a, is that your archaeological roots coming through? <clears throat> I don't know I think I was um I was a terrible site engineer I would put everything in the wrong place I would do the setting out all wrong the bricklayers would be cursing me because they'd have to recourse because I got the foundations in the wrong place. And... Lang were famous for their bricklayers, so I can imagine the curse. Well, Lang were, yeah, <laughs> Lang were not happy with me. I mean, I think um, they put me on, I was on, well, I was on one site and I was reasonably well supervised, but another one, they just left me there on my own with two months experience and a field light and I got kind of, uh, so, um, but um, I think it's really, uh, working on sites really invaluable actually. And I, I went on to work as a, a site engineer on the Jubilee line and, um, and, uh, I just, I think, I mean, they're quite, particularly the Jubilee line was sort of 12-hour day shift week followed by a 12-hour night shift week on rotation for quite a long time. I remember you go into those tiring experiences without really noticing, like you're kind of boiling lobster, you know, and then you don't realise until you stop how much of your kind of consciousness <laughs> you've lost in the process. But, but I think really... Um, really interesting and really, really interesting for designing because you have a much better feeling for what can be done um, on on site. I mean, I wouldn't say that I really know what can be done on site, but I probably have more feeling than somebody who's never been a site engineer. Um, I can and, say, um, I, I, at one stage in my life, I, I shared, shared an office with a tunneling engineer and realized they're quite a strange breed in a way. And the thing I found interesting was how <laughs> touchy feely they were with materials. Uh, and that they, yeah, it was all about the way it looked when it was coming off the face of the TBM, and 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 they all wanted to go down and kind of poke it with a pencil before they made a design decision. Given the yeah. fact that you've then got into un 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 unconventional materials, has any of that rubbed off? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the tunneling thing was just such a bizarre. You know, you be. I mean, it was like it's like a um, uh, a Ridley Scott type environment you know that you're kind of going down these stairs in this case on and you're walking along these tunnels into these tbms you know and it's just kind of a weird environment but it didn't really have much to do with some um, uh i mean obviously it is engineering but it wasn't really it's just kind of experientially a very strange uh, strange place but i think um we I mean, we were doing all the underground works and it was kind of really i mean you know i'm soft as Soft, I was going to say I'm soft as shy, but you can edit that. <laughs> well, you but the, uh, but you know, I mean, it's a really kind of you know, tunneling is a tough game, and uh, 
So we were doing, for two years, we were doing all the underground stuff. And then we were doing the overground works and the, uh, the, the kind of tops on the shafts with um, Ian Ritchie. And uh, the architect from Ian Ritchie would come yeah. to site and start talking about concrete finishes. And I remember thinking, what is this guy on? We've been, you know, we've been like two years underground, you know, knee deep in bentonite and whatever. And now this guy's coming along saying the little glint of light in the uh, polished olivine, you know, and I was kind of like bemused and also sort of slightly fascinated by the kind of architectural, I hadn't really had anything to do with architects before. And I think um, uh, actually in the end, I found it quite interesting and then went to work for, for Whitby Bird as probably as a consequence of um, working with um, that guy. And uh, it's it, it was another side, another side to, you know, slightly more, uh, Urbane side to engineering than the <laughs> the, the way the way it looks and how how hard it is to fight for that. Um, for a while, your career then turned onto kind of quite huge and quite steely projects. You were you know Wem Wembley Stadium with Sinclair Knight Mertz, and then the Wall of Nations at, at the Athens Olympics with Calatrava, and also um, the Turning Torso, which is a beautiful a beautiful thing. These scale of projects which can suck you in. I went through a phase of basically everybody wanting me on mega projects, which kind of is a different animal from what you've kind of become, you know, if, if, if I'm going to think of your trademark tends to be, you know, be beautiful little things now, not yeah, some, some of them. Are quite yeah. Right. But, but yeah, that, now what, so what, so what did, did you run away from that scale of project or did, did you learn things that allowed you to then apply, apply them in, in, yeah, as you go down into the deep. Yeah. I mean, I don't like, um, I mean, I like structural problems at any scale, and I was really happy working at um, uh, working at SKM and working at, at Calatrava and doing stadium, stadia and um, and kind of high rise and stuff like that. And I really like, you know, we would be working in mega newtons, you know, and designing yeah. connections out of duplex, you know, and you know all kinds of all the fatigue and wind tunnel, you know, and all the stuff that would be involved in that was absolutely fascinating. And I really, I find it really interesting and really uh, and. Uh, really interesting challenge at that scale. I don't like projects that have lots of boring facets that you've got to keep track of, you know? So if you have, so for example, the turning torso tower is a singular problem um, that, uh, that I was working on um, with the guys in, uh, in Spain. And I think that, you know, there were particular bits of that that I was, you know, you, you, know, you, you might be working on the turning torso tower, but I remember spending a lot of time designing the, the node at the bottom of the spine. There's a 300 millimeter diameter pin with kind of interlocking plates and uh, was a you know massive analysis uh, problem. So really, you know, even the you know the, the big projects are composed of little projects, and even a, you know it doesn't really matter what size it is. And I think the I mean I really like the big projects, and I really like the glamour of a big lift, you know, or a giant crane, or you know. 100 mil thick steel plates and all that. I really like that. But when we started our practice, um, uh, people don't come along to two man practices and give them <laughs> 100 million pound high rises uh, on day one. So I think yeah, it was. <laughs> so we kind of we went from doing, um, you know, I went from, I mean, we were doing the, the thing I was doing on Wembley Stadium wasn't really the stadium design, it was more of a temporary works problem to do with the arch, um, the arch layback. So the arch was erected. And we had to kind of hold it up temporarily while the roof was built with tethering it to the cores, 21 mega newton loads in the cables. You know, we were doing this monitoring how the stadium responded to the to the moving to the kind of loading of the arch, which was a extremely complicated and very stressful and very frightening. But actually the day that you're there, we had all these monitoring points all over the stadium, watching the graphs of the of the predicted movements against the actual movements and the kind of creaking as the stadium took up the load is really exciting and really yeah. but then I think after doing that thing about four weeks later we started web yates and I'm doing a loft conversion now what size are your ceiling joists oh uh, four by twos aren't they yeah well we want some five mil wood screws and that and a bit of ply you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, the, uh, but you know the, actually um the I mean the subject is exactly the same so we would so we would be trying to push innovation in loft conversions like it really annoys me that people put steels in lofts or in houses in general. I think it's like just seems completely overkill. Um, and so we would kind of we would coat the existing um, 
ceiling joists and rafters in plywood and make stress skin loft conversions and all the builders will be telling us oh you can't do that that'll never work you know and so yeah. we'd be no, we're going to screw down 18 mil fly bit of glue you know and, and whatever and so we kind of make these stress skin boxes on the roofs and i think that's you know like things are interesting at any scale and i think a lot of the things that that i learned on well, the principles that i learned on really big projects you apply on little projects and uh, I'm glad I'm recording in here. I feel back embarrassed about the room behind and the amount of steel holding up the ceiling in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think this. I don't understand the. Um, yeah, everyone's throwing steels around like nobody's business. I think it's. I, I find it very interesting to like yeah. to, to just with a few sheets of ply make lofts stand up without you know a load of two hundred three UCs in it. I think that's we do live in boxes, don't we? Yeah. I, you you started down that route. The next question was really after those big projects you're doing the scary step of 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 setting up web yates with andy webb and, and and as i wrote at the end here so, so what were you thinking what we what were you but you've started to talk about what you're doing but what what was what was the attraction was you know it, it, was it just was it you know well, why why instead of actually just being able to hide within an organization and having nice things given to you to do which is probably where i've hidden most of my life why did you suddenly actually want to have the scariness of having to um, I think uh, I think me and Andy had worked, I mean, me and Andy worked together at, uh, at Whitby Bird and um, it was an exciting place to work, you know? It was kind of a boutique engineering practice. The office looked good, the people were interesting, you know, they go out and go drinking and uh, it was a lot of fun and, and kind of glamorous, you know? Architects would be coming and going and it just seemed, you know, in the 90s seemed... Um, yeah. Uh, like an exciting thing to do. And the fact that um, Mark and Bryn had built that from nothing, you know, was quite inspirational. So I think we were definitely, um, you know, influenced by having worked for them and, and, and had the idea that we would create something, something similar. And I think at the same time, um, I worked for quite, a, you know, Sinclair Knight Mertz was, you know, quite, it was a good company and kind of well organized, but quite, um, quite corporate. And the people that were higher up played the corporate game, talked the corporate, you know, took the corporate line and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people with MBAs, you know, who are, you know, we we're maybe going to talk about management later on, you know, but who are good managers. But the flavor of the thing was that as an engineer or as a technical engineer, you are uh, the product, not the, um, uh, not the, um, yeah, you're just the offer, if you see what I mean. So you either have to kind of let go of the technical um and become managerial or you're a kind of performing uh, performing monkey for a lot of people with mbas which is kind of <laughs> <laughs> so um but also, but i think also just but there's something about i'd rather be as i was kind of having this shipping analogy you know i'd rather be the uh, the captain of a small fishing boat than a kind of white uniformed floor walker on the casino deck of a of a cruise line <laughs> if you see what i mean <laughs> it seems a little bit more uh... <laughs> until we've got we've had two movie references and now we're going north it's great <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that that is that, that is that is i kind of i understand it but it's also quite quite scary quite scary i'm gonna this is almost this, i put this in because because and you talked a little bit about the role of architecture and engineering it's also it, i find it in and this is probably driven by me having worked with at Arab with Fosters um, up against Calatrava a few times. So we butted head to head. And it was interesting how all the architects used to talk about him being an engineer. And actually there was a lot of architecture there as well, but also noticing the fact that you're a multidisciplinary practice. I don't know much about it. I may know you about you from a sort of structural point of view. So, so has, has that, that blurring and nuancing of architecture and, and um, and engineering always being with you. How do you work with your architects and and and, and what's the role of multidisciplinary? Because evidently when you started off, you were yeah. doing your single disciplinary loft conversions. How how's that become a multidisciplinary act? Yeah, I think we um I mean <clears throat> that's a very vague well, question. First of all, I mean, first of all, I think like building, you know, building in general is not beyond, you know, building a build building most buildings. 
<clears throat> what you need to know to build a building is not beyond the scope of one person's mind. You know, it's not that complicated. So structural engineering is not that hard. Architecture is not that hard and nor is M&E engineering. I, I always say if it is that hard, you probably got the wrong answer. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, so I think like you, you know, the kind of, I think the, um, I think the authorship of buildings would be better to come from fewer people to, or maybe to come from one person rather than so rather than one person doing a specialist bit on 10 buildings yeah uh actually maybe it's better that one person does one building and another person does another building because you'd have more joined up and i think buildings suffer from you know lack of succinctness so when you look at you know when you look at a lot of modern buildings there are so many layers and so many so you'd look at it you know you look at a building and you see the air conditioning and you see the slab and you see the ceiling and you see the top hats and back rails and, and uh, bits of insulation and plasterboard and some suspension system and something else and some tiles on the surface, you know, and, and, and the architecture isn't particularly well integrated with the engineering and the m and &E isn't integrated with the structure or the architecture and they just become these baggy, massively expensive, in succinct uh, objects. Whereas actually, if a single person sat down for a reasonable period of time, and said, you know, how can we get rid of all of these layers and just condense it into one single object that does what it's supposed to do? I mean, I know that's impossible, but um, mm -hmm. but you can kind of work towards the ideal of of kind of condensing it into something very simple that does everything you need it to do in a joined up way. And um, it just, um, sorry. Um, uh so i think we so we had we had architects at one stage and i think you know Cal calatrava is um Actually, that's interesting i was almost i was almost fishing for that for that question about well, why didn't you but Emily, you tried it for a while yeah no we did i mean we i mean um uh i mean i was when i went when i worked at whitby bird there was a um el croquis you know the spanish um, architectural magazine was sitting on a desk and all of calatrava's bridges were in there i'd never heard of him before and i opened this thing and it was like oh my god this guy is totally amazing and yeah. uh um, uh, really just audacious structures, you know, and structurally uh, kind of exhibitionist uh, architect uh, stroke engineer. And I was thinking it was incredible. And I applied for a job in Spain. I didn't realize it was him, but it turned out to be him afterwards. And uh, um, so I went to Valencia and I lived there for a couple of years and um, worked in the office there. And uh, I mean, I think I, I didn't know him very well because he was based in Zurich. So we were based in Valencia, but... Um, but I think it's really, in, really interesting. I mean, he's a showman, you know, and um, they have this thing in Valencia, they, they call them um, uh, Las Fallas. They're the big, they're the big uh, paper mache sculptures that they put up every Easter and set fire to in the street. And people are really showy, you know, they want these things to be massive, kind of show off structures. And so people were saying that um, Calatrava was very fallero, which means that he's showing off, you know, with these. Uh, and so he's, I mean, all of his buildings are just kind of structural, sculptural tour de force the fact that people actually have to use them or someone's got paid for them is a secondary concern for sure <laughs> but um but i think i i found that really inspirational i think we we um so we were you know and i think we worked with mark mimram as well and they're kind of similar yeah. blend and i think we wanted to go down that route so we had architects for a while and um it's, you know, architecture is a tough gig. Engineers, mm -hmm. you know who your clients are because they're architects and they're in the yellow pages, you know, or developers or whatever. Whereas actually, uh, you know, in a small scale architectural practice, your client is anyone in the street. And I think it depends um, very greatly on contacts. And so we kind of struggled to get work. We did a few projects, um, but uh, in the end, economically, it was too much of a, uh, it's kind of a bit of a burden and it didn't really, uh, didn't really work out but um but we did at the same time we, we built in m and &E, and i think the um uh andy lapinias came from arab um to join us um to uh, run the M mep team and i think um i personally really enjoy the kind of overlap of structure and mep you know that we'll 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 put thermal mass in the structure where we need it to avoid air conditioning you know we'll configure the beams and the building in a certain way that allows the, the services to be fitted together and um uh and just really enjoying kind of owning the whole the whole engineering problem for the building rather than um rather than just a bit of it 
Um, so does the scale of your teams and your projects allow you to have that kind of ownership? I, I always I always find it amusing now that a lot of people talk about systems engineering, which is a new specialism to overcome the fact that we have too many specialists. Um, where, whereas actually this idea of a sort of the specialist generalist, it seems to be what you're you're talking about. The fact yeah, that I think you, you I mean, do we're everybody to know a little bit of everything. Yeah, I mean, I guess our projects are on average around the 10 million mark. I mean, we work, you know, we're doing we some big um, infrastructure job at Heathrow is maybe 180 million or something for an underground baggage handling thing. And we still do tiny little, you know, back extensions and things because uh, it's good for the, um, mm. the young engineers to do that. Actually, that's, even that's, that's, that's granularity is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And well, I think you learn a lot on a little job that you apply on a big job and vice versa. But I think probably on average, our jobs are kind of 10 to 15 million ish. And I think, um, you know, they're small enough for very few people to understand, you know, and to really get to know the job. And um, and I think the proliferation of, um, of I, I think it's a gazelle. It's like, they're like gazelles, you know? Like, you have a thousand gazelles running across the veld and a lion, you know, and the gazelles know that they've only got a one in a thousand chance of being eaten. <laughs> you know? Whereas if there's one giant gazelle, the line's definitely going to bite him. <laughs> so I think, you know, design, I think design teams as well. I think the human... That's, the, that's quite an image. <laughs> well, the kind of human um, tendency to add complexity, you know, whenever there's a problem, oh, let's add something, let's add something else, make everything really complicated, combined with the fact that I think people like the gazelle approach on design teams, they don't want to be exposed as being the author of any problem. So if you have a hundred different specialists, you're like the gazelles, you know, no, you know, you're not necessarily going to get sued because you can say, oh, well, that was just yeah. a package or, you know, nobody wants to take responsibility. And I find actually what I find really interesting is that when we sit in design team meetings and somebody says, oh, yeah, but who's going to warranty that? And I'm like, well, we're designing it and we've got PI, so we take responsibility for it. Everybody else dives for the, the, for the yeah. door, you know, and I find particularly um, business owners, I think, who are, who are more used to taking risk. Mm. So, for example, if, if I make a cock up and I get sued, I've got 50 grand excess on my insurance. I'm personally going to lose money, you know, and, okay. um, and quite a lot. So if, if we make a mistake, then, you know, I'm going to get whereas all the other people in the in the design team meeting are probably employees who might get a slap on the wrist from their boss, you know, or something. Okay. But actually, those people are really I, I guess they're they're being responsible with the responsibility that's been delegated to them and they're trying to. You know, they're trying to treat it in a, in a respectful and reasonable way, looking at it on the one, on one hand. But on the other hand, it's so uncourageous when you have no consequences not to take, not to, I mean, the, and I think there's, a, sorry, I'm talking all over the place here, but there's a, there's, there's a tendency to, there's a race to the bottom on risk in design team situations. So, so you say, oh, I'm going to do A, B and C. Oh, but what if B goes wrong? Oh, well. Uh, okay, let's not do that. Let's do, you know, like every, every time somebody raises a concern, a lot of steel. The, the bar is dropped, you know, and, yeah. and um, so the project gets safer and safer and safer. And, you know, if anyone, you know, if I, if, you know, oh, we're going to build the walls out of brick. Oh, what if the mortar mix isn't right? Oh, well, maybe we shouldn't use brick. Maybe we should use something, you know, and like people just worry their way into a state of, um, of, yeah, um, yeah. of and no, nobody wants to contradict somebody who's in, the, so people, particularly when you have big teams of, you know, people are paid, oh, I, I averted that risk. You know, I've come to the meeting and I've averted, a, I've averted a risk, you know. So everyone's kind of in the game of flagging up potential pitfalls and mitigating them. But in the end, you just end up with such um, over overcomplicated, overly protective, over-defensive uh, um, designs. And, and the kind of risk aversion means that you actually spend loads of money and fold in loads of complexity risks into a project that weren't there in the first place. So we have, a, you know, we have a job, a case in point. Um, recently, we wanted to build a CLT, a very simple CLT building. So I was saying, look, we'll just build CLT. Doesn't need to be insulated, doesn't need any cladding. Uh, so we'll just build a CLT building. And everyone's worried about, oh, what about the moisture in the air? What about this, that, and the other? So we have this huge debate and everything gets really complicated. And then they decide in the end that they're going to protect the CLT with timber cladding. I think, <laughs> what is the point in protecting timber with timber 
you could leave the CLT out there in the first place. You could add the timber on afterwards if it didn't work out, you know, but it's just, but then, and then suddenly everyone's complaining, oh, the budget's gone up, it's too expensive, you know, and uh, it takes too long and it's too complicated and all this stuff, you know, and it's like, why, why do we end up chasing ourselves into yeah. this, you know, building in the UK is so expensive and projects are not developed because they're, you know, they're too expensive to build. And you look at a design team and there's a hundred people in there and every single person is adding in a little thing for a bit of risk mitigation and nobody wants to take responsibility for everything. And then the gazelle like proliferation of specialists and, yeah. and facade consultants and, you know, nobody really wanting to do anything other than their little narrow thing just makes buildings so expensive and uneconomical and, un and unsustainable because you use all this material and everything else. I think uh, a bit more personal responsibility, a bit more primary authorship across disciplines and uh, uh, a healthier attitude to risk, uh, you know, more, more appropriate risk level on projects. Um, uh, um, you know, not trying to totally eradicate, how are you gonna, you're gonna be a property developer, I'm gonna build a load of buildings, but I don't want any risk, you know? You don't want any risk, stay at home, you know? I mean, yeah. well, like building is risk, contractors take risk, you know, building is, uh, it's risk. And so as a consultant, for example, you can't, you know, you need to, the risk bar needs to be at an appropriate level. You know, it doesn't need to be overly safe because, you know, it, it's, it's not. Do you, do you know. think people, people also worry about the right risk? Because somehow with all that complexity sneaking in, people kind of seem to, seem to end up, as you say, kind of arguing about, you know, we'll have to put some cladding over the top of this, forgetting the fact that now covers up any future problem. The one that springs, to mind and when you look at it is the, the the bridge that collapsed in in florida for instance which had a very you know it was a cable stay bridge that then stopped being a cable stay bridge could but they still tried to carry on making it look like that and you ended up in the end with a bunch of engineers looking at something and nobody acted because they were all you know, the whole procurement process you could talk about grenfell like this the whole procurement process has divided everybody up until almost nobody owns the whole and you've talked about the great thing about having somebody who understands the whole thing do you do you see do you see that and is it something that in some ways your approach is fighting against oh yeah i totally i mean we on lots of projects we end up where where you see the division between um between lots of different people and that people's individual stakeholdings are um are diluted then um then yeah i think that happens a lot that you end up with Nobody takes individual responsibility. Nobody's, you know, everyone's in the bus. No one's in the driver's seat, you know. And um, uh, and, uh, and I just, you know, we've seen projects where the the cost and the complexity escalates because issues are ping ponging between different parties who are not taking uh, individual responsibility or just can't take individual responsibility for them because the responsibility is split between two people. And, uh, it just seems really. Um, mm really wasteful. Uh, I mean, I think the, um, I mean, there's a kind of, yeah, so I was thinking that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we need to have a grown up conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm putting this badly because I think I don't want to have a Gerald Ratner moment and say, we don't care about our clients for it. Obviously we do, you know, and we don't, we don't take um, uh, unwarranted risks, but being overly, let's say you have a project and that project unveils a certain level of risk the components of that project should be at that risk level there's no point in making certain aspects of it overly yeah. safe it's like you pay you know you probably pay 30 percent of the budget to get to 90 percent security and you probably pay the other 70 percent of the budget to get to 100 it's what is his name particles um theorem you know that you there's a great yeah. you know you get 80 percent of the out of the um i didn't know it had a name it's 80, it's 80, 20. Sorry. Yeah, the eighty twenty rule. Yeah, um, so you know, buildings could be a lot more economical. This uh, look, uh, as an example, I look at my Victorian street. Every house in the street has a five hundred millimeter deep corbelled footing. Yeah, maybe three percent of them have had to have some kind of underpinning. We're on clay soil, surrounded by trees. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. pretty typical situation in London. If I built these houses today. Every single house would have a three meter deep, 600 millimeter wide concrete filled trench footing. Yeah. Or pile it. Or they'd be piled. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, imagine a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the environmental consequences and the cost and the time of doing that. A much better approach would be to say, I tell you what, uh, give me five grand per house 
and you pocket five grand per house because the foundation is going to cost 10 grand. And if something goes wrong with your foundations, I personally will come around and fix it, you know, and then yeah. I'm a million quid up. You're a million quid up. We've got a little underpinning company doing a bit of work from time to time, you know, and uh, we haven't dug up half of Wilsdon and pumped 8 million tons of concrete into the ground. You know, just as a positive example of, you know, the risk, um, the way that people treat individual risk on individual components is not commensurate with overall risk and and risk levels that um well, I think that we done, I, I think we've done fantastically well there because I was wondering how to get jumped to the next question and thinking I was changing subject. But <laughs> sustainable design <laughs> perfect link. Um <laughs> so you've been talking about it and exploring what it means for, for a lot of years. And, and if we were going to say there was an upside from the climate emergency um, is that we seem to be at the point where there's a tipping point where instead of being a few designers banging on about it and a few weird clients, it's now moving much more into the fact that clients generally feel they need it or want it. And also consumers are saying they'd like to have it, please. Um, are you, uh, and also I'd hope from, from where I work at the moment, we're starting to get contractors who are capable of, of delivering it. Um, there's a, evidently there's a long way to go, but have you seen a change in attitudes over the last 15 years? And are you feeling positive about the way this <laughs> emergency is going? Well, I think, I mean, um, I mean, I think, uh, I think uninvited, unsustainable, unsustainable design. I mean, aside from the environmental consequences is an offense against reason. You know, it's just wasteful. It's like wasteful of people's labor and people's effort, and wasteful of the environment. It's just, um, uh, you know, why would you, yeah, it, it, it just kind of really annoys me that, um, you know, people put all of this energy and stuff into things that were, were unnecessary. But um, I think there's, when, um, when I went to college in 1992, uh, we did an environmental module and they were talking about sustainability. Timber's sustainable, steel isn't sustainable, steel has a high carbon footprint. 1992, yeah? Mm -hmm. And like, and then that was on the back of people yeah. starting to talk about global warming in, like, I don't know, whatever, 1920 or, you know, became to prominence in about 1987. So these issues have been there forever. And, uh, you know, and it struck me at the time that, yeah, it's much better to uh, build with wood if you can, you know, and, um, and, and other low energy materials. So I've always, kind of thought about that and Greta Thunberg has definitely woken everybody up to the um to the issue more recently and it just amazes me that everybody wasn't aware of the issue in the first place I mean uh, yeah. well you know where the hell what the hell they're really thinking you know it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I think it's like the, the tide of morality of you know um, with MPs expense scandals and other scandals that have you know been things that were acceptable in the 70s or just kind of not really talked about are suddenly not acceptable in 2010 and everyone gets exposed and whatever but i think uh, the sustainability thing is like that the kind of moral um the, the the kind of rising tide of morality has is beginning to um slide over people who are using unsustainable practices i think the um the, the beginning of the sustainable building movement was definitely focused on um energy and use um but actually, um, I mean, and, and that's been, you know, the thrust of the building regulations. There's nothing in there yet really reasonable or really toothsome to deal with embodied carbon. And uh, so M&E engineers have been really protagonizing in the, in the sustainability thing for a long time because of that. But, um, uh, and structural engineers haven't really thought that it was their, their issue and people haven't thought about embodied carbon. But if you build a building today and it's going to last for 40 years the air conditioning and the heating of that building in 20 or 30 or 40 years time is coming from a vastly decarbonized grid and you're saving carbon back then if i make a load of concrete today that carbon is out in the atmosphere today and it's that carbon that's going to change the climate so i don't understand why you would prioritize um long-term gains over mm -hmm over immediate you know actually it's more important to I mean, i'm saying you, you should prioritize long-term gains and you should prioritize current thinking but the um uh the the heavy-handed use of steel and concrete in so many buildings is uh completely unnecessary and um uh massively damaging for the environment and um and i think we 
you know, we would push. So we advocate for, I mean, we design loads of steel and concrete buildings, obviously, and, you know, where we, and we, but we try and offer clients timber alternatives and, uh, and stone alternatives because it's, you know, stone is also low, um, quite low carbon. Um, but uh, people don't often take them, you know, and I don't think people feel a personal responsibility for the bigger picture and there's no you know you think if the government's not mandating you to do something then anything that you can do that's legal must be morally acceptable and um you know that might not be you know that certainly hasn't been true if you look back through history there are plenty plenty of events that were legal by the standards of that government but were actually quite immoral <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know from moral compasses change yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, from slavery to the Holocaust, you know, I'm not saying sustainability is an issue on that scale, but, um, but you know, we have to take personal responsibility for what we're doing and, uh, and not hide behind the fact that what we're doing is legal. It's like, should be, yeah, you know, actually. But I think um, uh, there aren't very many good reasons why we shouldn't be building more with timber using less concrete. And, um, and so, cli and so clients are like, well, we want to decarbonize they're starting from a really high carbon point. So if you have a big commercial building, you might be on a thousand kilos of carbon per square meter. So the REBA 30 um, guidelines are, I can't remember, 300 or 400. So you're quite high. If you swap out the concrete for um, GGBS or something like that, you'd be like, wow, I saved 30% of carbon. And it's like, you know, but you started on a thousand, you know, you should be down at like 200 just because you improved the situation from when you were really, really bad to now being still quite relatively bad doesn't mean that that gets you off the hook. You know, actually, no. you should be building with timber and building with some... Um... Working with contractors now, I realise that actually most concrete you buy in London has GGBS in it anyway. So everybody's claiming virtue for something that actually is now just a standard practice. Well, but, also, but also GGBS is uh, coming out of a blast furnace. Yeah. You know, so that's not a low energy process. And... You might say, oh, it's a waste product of the steel industry. The steel manufacturers say that steel is a waste product of the GGBS industry. I mean, there should not be blast furnaces, right? Yeah. While there are blast furnaces, there's still a problem. And um, so the thing to do would be to, and I think like, you know, t I mean, we work with timber and stone. Stone is in the ground. It's already made, you know, it has no uh, embodied carbon in it. And it's really strong and really useful, you know, and timber's growing on trees, you know, with relatively little carbon impact. Um, why would you not? Uh, you can so easily um, embrace these materials on an industrial scale, but nobody wants to put their head above the parapet and take. Uh, I, I thought I thought your point in I thought your point in your lecture about about the, the amount I can't remember how how many Ben Nevises or whatever it was the the, the the size of the hole that if you dug all the stone for the world's buildings. Oh yeah, tiny. Yeah. Yeah, compared to, to compared to the the, the 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 impact that making the cement for the world's buildings um, has, I thought that was well, very cement. Bad. I mean, cement is dug out of the ground anyway. So and so is you know all concrete, all steel. It's all coming out of the ground, whether it's stone, steel, or but obviously, yeah. you know, I can get you know if I if I get if I get a suitcase and I get a grinder and a drill and a wire saw and a hydraulic jack and a and a pump, all of which I can get pretty much in a suitcase, right? I can turn up on the side of the quarry and I can cut blocks of stone and I can drill holes through them and I can put a wire through that and I can post tension it and I can make you know, the equivalent of a steel UB with the same capacity and like no carbon footprint, hardly any plant, you know, like if I had to make a steel beam, I'd have to go to Brazil and I'd need to you know, I need to take all of that stuff and I'd need a blast furnace and then I'd need a whatever. Yeah, well, you well, haven't really wasted anything with the stone. <clears throat> well, yeah, but all of that, but you know, just imagine how much industrial, how many industrial processes you need to make a steel beam. I can turn up on the side of a quarry with a suitcase and I can make a stone beam. Like, you know, like, but not good for, not good for GDP. To have such <laughs> singular solutions to problems, you know, actually, you think there's an interest in having lots of churn in the production of stuff, you know, in terms of um, rising yeah, GDP. Specialisms are good. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this is less, less about engineering and architecture and more about complete economic revolution. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, 
Well, the economic have... revolution, that's another. I mean, we, I was writing an article recently for the um, Architectural Review about, about waste, but really uh, economic revolution is tax on labor. And so you, you build flat slabs everywhere and standardized systems because labor is expensive. Labor is expensive because the tax is on labor. If you put the tax on the concrete, you would be making waffle slabs everywhere because labor would be relatively cheaper than, than concrete. So an economic revolution that would create a lot of sustainability would be taxing material rather than taxing human labor. So why would you destroy the environment and have huge swathes of people unemployed or living on the poverty line because you put tax on people? If you move the tax to the material, you'll stop destroying the environment and you'll employ a lot more people. Yes. I was always fascinated when we dug up a foundation in a 1920s coal mine once, which was built like a ziggurat, which was really complicated with bits of formwork. And then we worked out it was actually built right in the middle of the um, collapse of the Deutschmark and, and the people were right. cheap, but buying foreign materials was really expensive. And yeah. Completely changed the design approach. Oh, totally. All of those, uh, Italy in 1950, Luigi Nervi, Beanie Domes, all that kind of stuff. South America, Felix Candela, uh, Eladio di Este, super thin domes, cheap labor, bad balance of payments, uh, not much steel, not much cement, you know? So, uh, so you make these very, very thin shells. Designers, engineers, like, I'm gonna double your fee because your wages are nothing, um, because, and you're gonna sit there and figure out how to make this building three millimeters thick. No, no. Yeah, because <clears throat> the material saving is much more valuable than your time. So we all think much harder, put in human labor and use far less material and end up living in a world of, of uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi rather than um, Ron Flat Slam. <laughs> yeah. well, it, and well, now we've come, come up with a fantastic PhD th thesis around the, the, link, the link between architectural innovation and... Um... <laughs> Economics. <laughs> well, that's the big, I mean, that's the big picture, isn't it? That actually all of these things are interconnected, you know, and um, totally interconnected. And um, uh, and that's why it's important not to just see your, and it's the kind of, it comes back to the authorship point. It's good to kind of zoom out and see the global economy yeah, and yeah. how that impacts what you're doing in your day-to-day -day job and, you know, what that, and, and not just think about um, your cog in the machine. So it, we, we, we've talked a lot. Of Sorry, I talked too much. No, <laughs> fine. And I, I encourage people. Um, in, 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 in many of you, this is, this is less, a, a less a script I've got in front of me, more of a, just a kind of just a series of prompts. <laughs> and you're allowed to go off the rails. Um, you, you use a lot of timber and stone. And actually one of, the, one of the most famous projects you worked on recently has been the 15 Clerkenwell Close, which has many awards and uh, both architectural and structural. And there was a complex planning history, which is a different story, which I've now read up on and was fascinating. Um, you used stone as a structural facade there. Um, how did that idea develop? Uh, and, um, and also, could you see a version of that building where you use stone further back in the building for everything? And so it became a stone structure. Yeah, we... Um... Well, I mean, so we sometimes promote load bearing stone as a solution and we've been, we started to design um, stone, uh, traditional stone cantilever stairs for a stonemason and um, uh, initially, and then because, um, because he could only sell staircases to people where there's a stair next to a wall, he wanted to make free spanning stone. So we started doing post tension reinforced stone. Um, and, you know, we've been doing a lot of R&D with that, with UCL and, and, and stuff. So we're kind of, you know, pushing the, the field of stone. And stone is an open, you know, it's an open, uh, it's a virgin landscape, you know, uh, engineering wise, because there's, you know, there are no codes, there's not really very much research. There's been, you know, nobody's put any money into researching stone and, and post tension stone compared to concrete steel. So, um, so it's really interesting. But Clark and Close, um, yeah, I mean, they're just, they're unreinforced blocks of stone holding up a building. Um, no different from load-bearing masonry or a million other load-bearing stone buildings all over the world. Everyone's like, oh my God, that's so incredible. How did you do that? Were there any precedents? It's like, yeah, there are quite a few precedents. You know, <laughs> what about the durability? Well, the mountains have been there for millions of years, you know, and, uh, you know, the Egyptian ruins have only been there for 8,000 years, you know, or whatever. So maybe it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's I know the Egyptian ruins are only 5,000 years old. But I mean, so it, there's nothing unprecedented about it. I think we, um, 
uh, with modern regulations, thermal bridging and disproportionate collapse had a few challenges. But also, we, I mean, we tend to, um, to do, um, so we'll try and do a little innovation on a tiny job, you know, where the risks are quite small and the scope is quite small. And then we'll maybe do an innovation on a slightly bigger job and a bigger job and a bigger job. And, um, so, uh, so I think at that point, and the point in the evolution of our stone knowledge, building a, a six story concrete frame <clears throat> with a load bearing stone facade was kind of what we what we knew at that point now we're doing a 10-story version in um in Finchley Road at uh, the the um uh back to the Stone Age exhibition in uh, the building center that we did we were kind of postulating that you could build the Clerkenwell Tower um you know 30 stories high and have post-tension stone floor right. plates within it so it could be a totally stone building um uh you know as an idea and would be hugely decarbonizing and um would require you know to go to move to that typology of building to move away from concrete to um uh to stone buildings as i said you turn up at a quarry with a suitcase full of plant you know and uh, get making it and that's all you need you know so um so it's not like you need to invest in massive industrial infrastructure to make the switch from concrete to stone somebody said to me oh, that's all very well building in stone, but what about the logistics? We were saying, you know, what are the logistics yeah. of liquid material on the back of a truck in a revolving tank that has to be delivered in one and a half hours from the point of creation, you know, like just poured into formwork. If, I, if we were building in stone and I suggested concrete, everybody would be like, you're a total idiot. What are you talking yeah, right. about? You know, it would be... So I think, um, uh, there's, I think there's a really exciting... Um, potential future for stone and particularly getting really high strength stones maybe not uh you know granites and gabbros and uh, basalts you know they're very very strong um, yeah. stones that have compression strengths of 250 newtons um you know very little shrinkage in creep compared to concrete um and uh quite good fire resistance so you can get you know you can get really good you know, so you can, I mean, you dig up a stone, you don't care what stone you're digging up, you know, so if you dig up a weak sandstone, or if you dig up a dolerite, I mean, there's a bit more effort in extracting the, the stronger yeah. stones, but you have a really effective building material. And, um, and I think actually, I mean, stone over timber, if I look at the size of a forest, and how much building material that yields at what strength, um, uh, actually stone is far more effective and far more concentrated and requires far less land you know so you have a really small quarry will produce a lot of stone at a strength of say 200 newtons to get that amount of structural capacity out of a forest you need mm -hmm. really big stands of timber acres and acres and acres for 25 years so and forestry isn't a great you know environmental thing in some ways being kind of monocultural and Whatever. So I think stone, but if someone in the government said, Oh, there's a they just bought Forge Masters, didn't they? You know, so they're suddenly starting yes, a I heard that industrial today. um intervention. But if so, someone in the government, you know, got off their backsides and built so I was thinking you could decarb you have two routes to decarbonization at the moment. One is start building with timber and stone, and as I said, all you need is a suitcase worth of plant to get the stone industry going. Uh two is build five nuclear power stations. Right. You know? Yeah. Don't be impractical, Steve. Don't get a suitcase of plant and start making stone beams. Build a, new, build a light water reactor. That's far more practical and more economical and more sensible. You know, let's get the Chinese and the EDF in here and, uh, you know, be beholden to them economically forever to pay for the nuclear reactors. When, you know, that's a much better solution than reach you know, regearing the stone industry and making some post-tension stone beams and using some more timber. It seems to be utterly absurd that we would go down a nuclear route to avoid, you know, to perpetuate our stupid addiction to concrete and steel in buildings. You know, like, we we're talking about bricks. Using bricks, the UK's brick consumption is the equivalent of two nuclear power stations in carbon terms. Really? So give up bricks or build two nuclear power stations. Which do you want to do? Yeah. People aren't very good at giving things up, are they? Yeah, but I just start being like, oh, but it's traditional. Is the nuclear power station traditional? Oh, well, you know, somewhere else. 
but it's not somewhere else for someone else. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like, oh, I really like bricks and mortar, but they've just built Sizewell C on my doorstep. Yeah. You know, what would you rather, you know, if you start, who's Got equating like those, who is equating traditional bricks and mortar construction, whatever stupid attitude that comes from with um, nuclear power stations? Yeah. And it's bonkers. Totally and, it's, bonkers. and going back to your, your thing about the impact of stone, actually, have you? I'm always been impressed by actually, okay, whilst it is a dramatic landscape down on Portland, you look at Portland and of course, actually that built London. Yeah. You can kind of see the, ho the holes that made London. Well, A, I mean, A, the, the extinguished quarries are quite nice environments. I mean, I, go climbing, I go climbing sometimes, it's quite nice to go climbing in a quarry. There's a lake and birds and trees and whatever, you know, it's not too bad and rocks. And, um, but also we were looking at Edinburgh, so Edinburgh is obviously a massive stone city. The, uh, I can't remember the name of the quarry, but the quarry that produced all the stone that made Edinburgh is under the Sainsbury's car park. Wow. So it's like, so you look at Edinburgh and you can see all the dark green patches of, um, of forestry in Scotland, you know, that are around yeah. there making relatively small amounts of building material, but suddenly there's Edinburgh. All of that came out of this tiny <clears throat> patch of land that's now been filled in as the Sainsbury's car park. So you think, you know, it's like, it's a no-brainer. Why would you build a nuclear power station when you could just, you know, very simply replace concrete and steel in a lot of buildings with low energy materials? Yeah. Let's jump subject. That, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was a good rant. Yeah, right? you're getting ranty. So. I enjoyed that. I did enjoy that. And we touched on this <laughs> before we started recording, but I'll, I'll let you run it again. You've now got about 60 people working at Web Yates, according to your website. Uh, and, and, and I know in the past, I accidentally, really accidentally ended up leading a large team for a while. And they needed all the things like pastoral care and accommodation and salary increments and cash flow and needed just general loving and things. And that all crowded out all the things that I'd gone into engineering for and all the things I loved, which was doing design. And for me, it ended up being like one of the most conflicted periods of my career. Uh, and I've kind of run away from that bit. You must have many similar pressures now with with sixty lovely people working at Web Yates. How are you? How are you coping? Um, I mean, it's not. I think, uh, yeah, it's not I, running a practice. You know, running the the managerial side of running a practice is is uh, is not my um, not my favourite thing. But it's kind of important. You know, you can't cook without washing up. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can't do all these, uh, you know, you can't be an autonomous um, designer without having a practice. And uh, having a practice means a certain amount of management and a certain amount of, you know, for the chef, a certain amount of washing up, you know. And uh, so I don't, uh, I think, and I think also it's very, um, it's very important as a, you know, as an engineer not to think that those things are um, unimportant or kind of, you uh, I mean, particularly financial management is very important. And I think it's, I, as we've grown as a practice from kind of me, you know, me and Andy started um, in the back of uh, another practice's archive room and uh, with one computer between the two of us and some secondhand desk that somebody had donated. And uh, so we really, <clears throat> I think we understand, well, I remember we came up with our first logo, which was Web Yates Engineers written in Arial. And then I remember making a, calculation sheet on excel and printing like 20 sheets of calculation sheet <laughs> so i know that our company is nothing you know our company is you know web yates is a meaningless uh, theoretical construct it's not a real thing whereas i think other people who perhaps come and work for us or interact with us as a business they see desks offices people computers you know the thing has a physicality you know and uh, and that they think that as a physical object, like a sort of titanic <laughs> thing, that it's, you know, it's enduring and it's unsinkable, you know, and it's, uh, it's going to last. Whereas I know that we made the logo up and <laughs> it just kind of, that the thing is just not a real thing and can be washed away in, uh, you know, in three months of bad cash flow, your business is gone, you know, or hire too many people and the business is gone, you know, or um, uh, get too many claims or whatever, you know, so it's really... Um, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very, very, very important to constantly be um, attentive to the kind of, you know, the life, 
blood of the and the and the financial health of the yeah uh, of the business um and it's very easy to very quickly lose you know we've learned the hard way sometimes very easy to quickly you know the bicycle starts to wobble and uh, very very easy to get into a into a mess so um and you know companies are not uh are not enduring things they're just um they're just ideas so um, that's, that's <laughs> Interesting, interesting way of thinking about them. Uh, we've avoided staircases. We're heading, heading towards the end, but we've avoided staircases actually most of the time. And because um, there's been a whole series of beautiful staircases you've worked on, which are evidently must be a kind of set of incremental thoughts that work, working on one of them must lead to a thought that leads to the next in a way, and potentially also then attracts the next client who wants a, another lovely staircase. Um, do you fear you're going to run out of of innovations uh like do you, and, and do you think there's always going to be one more thing that you want to incorporate in the next one will, um, your, will your fascination end i don't know i mean i'm kind of um we've done so many stairs and i don't and I, as you said it becomes self-perpetuating and i don't really um i think um I mean, they're great things. They're like little bridges, you know. They're like little low risk bridges with no category three check. <laughs> kind of they're very, very free. You know, even building control don't really. I think that's why I, I absolutely are fascinated by them. They, you've got the bridge, the bridge, the bridge fetish. And now you, as you say, little, little beautiful bridges. Yeah. So yeah, I think the stairs are just like yeah, tiny bridges, and um, uh, and so you can be quite experimental, you know, and they're not massively risky. And uh, and yeah, we take like, one idea from another job to another job and tweak it a bit and come up with new ideas. And I think, you know, like music, there's no, um, <laughs> there's no like, you've only got so many notes, but uh, there's no limit to the number of combinations of notes that you can um, you can make. So I think, but I, I think um, the kind of general fetishization of staircases is. Uh, you know, I think there are lots of other elements of buildings that could be fetishized, you know, so if you're building your mansion, you know, you'd be like, oh, I want an amazing staircase, but maybe you can have an amazing roof or an amazing canopy or an amazing, you know, something, some other aspect could be amazing. Yeah. So, um, so I like, um, I mean, I really enjoy those sorts of things. And I think, so we did uh, a little house in um, Maidenhead a long time ago, and we were going to do a fancy stair, and there was going to be a big plasterboard roof. And, um, uh, we came up with the idea that actually it would be better to do a really boring stair than to do this kind of strappy Mikado stick roof instead of the plasterboard. <clears throat> it's kind of major feature of the room and uh, kind of interesting engineering solution and a very pretty thing. And I kind of was thinking it's really, you know, if you have a building, there are always, I think that the, I mean, I think, uh, Buildings should not be steel structures covered in plasterboard. I think it's totally boring. And I think it just shows a total lack of virtuosity on the part of the designers to come up with a building, which is a structure, yes. which is in itself intrinsically elegant and interesting to look at, rather than put up a frame and clad it with whatever you want, Las Vegas style. So I think the, and I think Clarkenwell is a particular example where people were like, Oh, have they used recycled concrete on that building? Oh no, it's limestone. Oh, I don't like it. It looks horrible. It's limestone, as a matter of fact. Why is it all rough like that? Well, that's how they extracted it from the quarry. Those are the marks from the quarrymen, you know, when they were yeah. them. Oh yeah, but what's it doing there? It's holding up the slabs of the building. Oh, is it holding the whole building up? Oh, I quite like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you get kind of and actually so 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 I think so I would say, you know, like like actually the intrinsic content of the structure gives a redolence beyond the beyond the visual appearance of the uh, building and then this makes for a better building a building that isn't skin deep you know a building that has a soul that you can see from the outside what the building looks like and you can see from the inside what the building looks like and you perceive it as an object which all sounds very flowery but the person in the street gets this too and responds to it and makes them feel better you know and uh, so i think that's um uh, i think uh, very disheartened by plasticky buildings covered in, you know, you get a hun Hyundai, Hyundai with a, uh, a fiberglass spoiler, a wing, a sports exhaust, tinted windows, uh, the kind of cowl over the engine and the ultraviolet lights down the kind of running boards and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, much architecture is that. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, whereas actually if you strip the Hyundai down to its kind of core, actually the core of the thing might be more interesting. And I think the the um, Fiona Banner did that thing in the in the Tate, uh, Tate Britain where she got a Puma jet and stripped all the paint off and put it on its back in the, uh, and I think they called it Birds of Prey or something. But this jet sat in the gallery of the Tate. It's this immensely beautiful object and stripped back to uh, its aluminium. You know, um, Norman Foster was standing in front of the 747 in that 1990s documentary going, I can't believe it's not architecture. It's not architecture, it's engineering. The better the engineering, the more beautiful, the more in tune with kind of physics and nature the thing becomes, the more beautiful it becomes. That airplane in Take Britain was so one there was such an incredibly, I mean, it's a you know, it's an object of war, so it's kind of sinister, but it's um it's such a beautiful thing. Nobody in the design team for a fighter jet is saying, oh, Rory, the nose cone sweep isn't really doing anything for me. Can we make it a little bit more bulbous or Not a bit more enough. bulbous or something? Nobody's interested in that. So I think, you know, engineering, if you really exercise yourself as a, as a building designer, as an engineer, and, you know, you have an open mind and an interest in materiality and the expression of the structure, actually we can make beautiful objects for people to inhabit without them being covered in plasticky crap. I was going to ask one more question, but I'm going to leave it there because that's a good enough message. Actually. <laughs> if we're going to leave it anywhere, that, 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 that's actually great. Um, and uh, and it feels like a good place to leave it. Thanks for talking today. I'm going to, it's, going to, take while, it's going to take a while to get the image of this huge gazelle wandering around the plane being attacked by lots of tiny <laughs> lions. Um, that's going to stay with me for a while. Um, the, form, the format of IAPC in conversation comes from an idea that, from Nate, David Knight. And IAPC is a group of designers and engineers that are passionate and inspired by the world about us. And to find out more, head to www.iapc.org.uk and we'll be back shortly with another one in this series. Thank you for listening.